Okay, now my next speaker is Victoria Law, who has written on prisons and women in prisons. She had a, a short period of prison herself, and she's a mother and a campaigner. Victoria. Yeah. All right. Before I start, you may have noticed this flyer on your chair. The forum doesn't have childcare. This is the fourth year running that it's refused to provide childcare even though parents and caregivers have requested it. So if you could take two minutes of your weekend or week and just call and say like, hey, could you have childcare next year and have inclusiveness for parents and caregivers and maybe some quiet for people that don't like children, that would be great. Um, if you don't have a flyer, come see me afterwards. I can give you a Well, one. we'll have something before this workshop closes. We will deal with that as a workshop. Okay. Carry on. So my experiences with the prison system started when I was in high school. So I don't know how many of you have heard of the school to prison pipeline, but I went to one of those schools in Jamaica, Queens, that was largely black, brown, and immigrant. Um, we had to go through metal detectors when we entered the building. We had to put our bag through those airport scanning things. You know, mm -hmm. we had to be patted down. There were security guards. A lot of people, um, if you were white or if you were, you know, if your parents had more resources, they figured a way to lie to get you out of that school. They would lie about where they lived. So basically, it was families with the least amount of resources and wherewithal and knowledge whose kids ended up going there. And a lot of times, it was just a warehouse for people to just sit there for eight hours a day. And these were perfect recruiting rounds for gangs. So gang, gang recruiters from Chinatown came around, and they started asking people, like, hey, would you like to make a couple of hundred dollars in a night, or would you like to sit here all day and do nothing and maybe flip burgers, you know, for the rest of your life. And think about when you were a teenager, when you're 14, 15, 16, a couple of hundred dollars versus sitting in a classroom being bored out of your skull. <coughs> you know, most teenagers are like, I can make some easy money, that's great. So a lot of my friends dropped out of high school, joined gangs, and one by one got arrested for gang-related activities and got incarcerated. I also joined the gang, but as a girlfriend, so I actually, you know, came in through the very gendered way of recruiting, and um, also ended up in jail on a, uh, an armed robbery felony charge when I was 16. So this is, you know, sort of like what happens when you don't have resources for your children. Um, so this catapulted my awareness of prison issues because I was in jail very briefly, got out. And I continued to support my friends who were inside. And I would go to see them in Rikers Island. And when you go to visit somebody in jail and you sit in the waiting room for visiting, you're sitting there for hours on end. And oftentimes, you're sitting there with the exact same people every week. And it's all black, brown, poor immigrant. Nobody there is you know, Bernie Madoff's wife. Nobody there is you know, um, Jeffrey Dahmer's spouse or whatever. You know, It's like all people who have, are in for either drugs or property crimes. So it's all people from the lowest economic strata. And that made me think like, hmm, you know, why is it that like, you know, we're not seeing all these like, you know, mass murderers and rapists and like, you know, like people who, you know, built, you know, citizens out of like thousands of dollars. And it didn't really coalesce for me until I started be, um, coming into the city and started reading prison literature because that was what I got attracted to. And I said, well, let me try to make sense of this experience. And so I started reading about prisons. I started reading about like the prison industrial complex. I started reading about mass incarceration. And all of these theories jived with what my reality was, sitting in those visiting rooms in Rikers Island and going upstate. And so I started working around prison issues. I, set up a, I helped set up a Books Through Bars program in 1996 to send free books to people. <laughs> you know, I started working with people who were incarcerated around you know, the organizing issues you know, up in upstate New York and in Trenton, New Jersey. And then I went to college, which most of my friends were not able to do, having gone to prison. Um, and when I was in college, I decided to do a paper on prison organizing. And so I spent a semester researching what prison organizing looked like after the 1970s, after the FBI and COINTELPRO had decimated many of the liberation movements, and what, ha what did prison organizing look like when it was divorced from 1970s radical organizing. And at the end of that semester, I looked at everything I had amassed and saw that it was all men. And I said, well, what are women doing to organize? So I started asking people who had been active in prisoner rights and anti-prison work for decades, what do women do? 
And for the most part, they were like, women don't resist, women don't organize. And at the time, there were about 100,000 women in prison. Now there's almost 115,000 women in prison. So I found it really hard to believe that almost 100,000 women just sat on their hands and endured prison conditions. So I started from scratch and I said, well, let me throw out everything I can think about, about prison organizing and prison resistance and let me look at what the issues are that affect women in prison and then see how they're organizing and resisting. So what I found is that women face many of the same issues that men do, you know, bad food, bad health care, racism, guard brutality, um, but then they also face very gender specific issues, you know, that aren't necessarily seen as prison issues. So women in prison face really atrocious health care <coughs> while they're in prison and medical care, but they also face the lack of female specific um, health care in prison. So oftentimes prisons don't have, you know, screenings for breast cancer or treatment for breast cancer or cervical cancer. Most prisons still don't have the resources to deal with women who are pregnant. They don't have OBGYN services. So the organizing around that doesn't necessarily get picked up as resistance among people who are looking at what do people on the inside do. More than half of all women in prison are mothers to children under the age of 18. And when you look at the way our society is gendered, oftentimes when a father goes to prison, there's a female relative willing to step up and take care of his children while he's inside. When a mother goes to prison, oftentimes she's a single head of household, or her partner is arrested alongside of her, or her partner might say, you know what, I can't take care of these children, you know, that's not my job, because of the way we see parenting. So children of incarcerated mothers are five times more likely to end up in the foster care system than children of incarcerated fathers. And that per becomes particularly devastating for communities and for children because in 1997, Congress passed the Federal Adoption and Safe Families Act, which mandates that if a child has been in foster care for 15 of the past 22 months, the state has to start termination of all parental rights. And only two states at the time made any exception for whether the parent was in, um, whether the child was in foster care because the parent was in prison. Um, New York State became the third state and only in 2010 did that pass because uh, formerly incarcerated parents and their advocates actually rallied and advocated and lobbied for this, um, for this exception for, decade, uh, for years and years and years, for like more than a decade. Um, women in prison are often shackled when they are transported, as are men. Yeah. They are also shackled when they are pregnant and in labor. Mm -hmm. So when they are brought to the hospital, <coughs> in labor, going to deliver a baby, they are often shackled, which means that they have handcuffs on their hands, a chain that goes around their belly, oh. and another chain that goes around their feet while the woman is in labor. And they are brought to the hospital, and it is not up to the medical staff on duty to say when those shackles come off. It is up to the guard that attends them. And if that guard doesn't feel like taking the shackles off at the time, or if the guard is out for a soda or whatever, the woman's life and the fetus's life is in jeopardy. And only 14 states have legislation either banning or limiting the use of restraints. Um, again, because incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and their allies have fought for these laws. Florida may become the 15th state. The legislature just passed it after much you know, pushing from people who are allies to women in prison. But it's sitting on right now and who knows if it will be signed. But that leaves. 35 to 36 states that still have this practice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, and um, women are also disproportionately abused and battered prior to incarceration, mm -hmm. and women have organized around this, specifically around battered women's movement and clemency for battered women. So two quick cases, in Ohio, in the late 1980s, women formed a support group called Looking Inward <coughs> for Excellence, which was supposed to just be a support group for women having long sentences. Mm -hmm. And when they got together, they realized that most of them had long sentences because they killed their abusers. Mm -hmm. In the late 1980s, people weren't talking about abuse and domestic violence. So it wasn't something that came up in court. It wasn't something they felt that they could then push other, you know, other, you know, the courts on. And then, they, so they got together, they talked about their experiences, and then they said, you know what? We don't deserve to be in prison for killing our abusers. Yeah, we don't yeah. deserve to be abused. Mm -hmm. So they started the first successful mass clemency campaign for women incarcerated for killing their abusers. Mm -hmm. And not only mm -hmm. did they, you know, organize amongst themselves to demand clemency from the governor, but they also went to all the different cells, all the different units, all the different cafeterias and places where women gathered, and they would talk to other women and say, hey, what are you in here for? 
oh, you killed your husband or your boyfriend, you know, and they would start working with them through the guilt and the denial about domestic violence and abuse. Um, like letting them know that it actually wasn't their fault, that, you know, like that they had been abused, no matter what had been told to them. They started working with them on drafting their own clemency petitions. It led to 25 additional women realizing that they, they should get clemency. This is, so this is 25 additional women that realized that it wasn't their fault that they had been abused, that they should not be locked up for having finally defended themselves. And in the end, the governor pardoned a bunch of the women, um, and it was the first mass clemency campaign. And this led to other battered women's groups in prison organizing. I have to stop you there. Good job. And I think that we have to demand of those of us who uh, are at universities mm -hmm. that they have to hear the prisoner mm -hmm. and the ex-prisoner mm -hmm. and the Victoria <laughs> and the, the relatives mm -hmm. of those inside. Mm -hmm. It's about time that women's studies That's began right. to study women mm -hmm. at the bottom. That's right. Right. If you want, if you, if you should say something right. in addition, because so, she's really interested. Okay, so a couple of quick things, because I know we've got like a lot of people, a lot of speakers, I don't want to take up so much space, um, is that uh, women, you know, have been losing their children and so a lot of prisons have um, like no provisions whatsoever for pregnant women. You know, they shackle them. 14 states, maybe 15, if this governor ever gets around to signing this legislation, have legislation limiting shackling. And it's not a top-down thing. I want to make that clear. It's because the women most affected have been organizing around this. It's because their allies have been organizing around this. But why is this even something that they should organize around? So in Massachusetts and in Georgia right now, there's legislation you know, introduced, and legislators don't want to look at this. You know, the general public doesn't believe that there is such a thing as shackling of women in labor because they call the prison up and the prison warden says, oh no, we don't have that. You don't need to pass that law. And again, it's the women themselves that are organizing this. They share their stories. And when you think about women in prison, you have to remember that women who end up in prison are often at the bottom of the economic, educational, race, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera ladder. So they're the poorest, they're oftentimes, you know, like the the, peop the women of color, they're the ones without resources, they don't have money for lawyers or, you know, and they don't have the white skin privilege or privilege. right to say, like, don't prosecute me, you know. Um, there have been studies that show that white people and white pregnant women are more likely to be diverted into drug treatment mm -hmm. than women of color. There's an increasing criminalization of pregnant women of color for using drugs. Now, you know, you could argue that, like, pregnant women shouldn't use illegal drugs, but then if you criminalize them and automatically sentence them to incarceration, mm -hmm. who's gonna go get help? Mm -hmm. Like, am I going to out myself as a drug user while pregnant and possibly face prison time and having my child taken away? Or am I going to continue using under the table and hope to hell that my OBGYN doesn't find out? Mm -hmm. You know, like, these are questions that should be asked. Um, there are prison nursery programs in several prisons in the country, but one question I want to add, like leave you with to shift it is, why aren't we thinking about ways to decarcerate mm -hmm. women? You know, mm -hmm. instead of saying like, let's build nurseries, let's yeah. have like mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. pediatricians or OBGYN oh, like wards, why aren't we looking at decarcerating? And I'm gonna go south of the border for a minute to tell you that in Argentina, they have, as in many Latin American countries, they allow mothers with children under the age of five to raise their children yeah, in the prison with them. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, this wow. kind of goes both ways because the prisons are still atrocious. You know, the food still sucks. There are cockroaches, there are rats, you know, like the children don't have happy or healthy childhoods. Like they, they come out and they can't deal with open spaces or men or, you know, like things that they haven't been exposed to for the first five years of their lives. But the alternative is them not being with their mothers. So women incarcerated in Argentina started writing first over conditions. We have children in this prison, why don't we have a pediatrician on call 24-7? Our children don't just get sick between 3 and 6 in the <coughs> afternoon on Tuesdays. You know, we need a pediatrician here at all times. So they rioted. They took over visiting rooms. They held guards hostage. They set things on fire. And the prison relented and gave them a pediatrician. You know, then they wanted better food. They were like, you can feed us grub. You know, like, but growing small children need more than just, you know, grub that fills their bellies and has no nutritional value. So they rioted over that. 
and they continue to demand better conditions. Mm -hmm. And that coupled with people on the outside also saying like, why do we have these children in prison, mm -hmm. but they should also be with their mothers, led to Argentina finally acknowledging the importance of the mother-child bond and starting to allow women who are pregnant or have small children to serve their sentences under house arrest. Mm -hmm. Which again, is not like quite the answer, but it's a step closer yeah, to getting women yeah, yeah. out of the prison system, right. getting people out of that prison system and not just saying like, let's pour more resources mm -hmm. into prison. Mm -hmm. So that's something that like some groups in the United States led by formerly incarcerated women and formerly incarcerated mothers are also talking about now. It's not, we want better services for mothers in the prison, but that's let's right. look at getting mothers and other people out of the prison. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Good job. And you know one reason that that happened in Argentina is because you have a tremendous women's movement that's in right. Argentina. Mm -hmm. The mothers of that's the, the disappeared and the grandmothers yeah. of the disappeared mm -hmm. are the ones who spearheaded the end of the dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Remember that against the Israelis who were funding that son of God. Mm -hmm. Um, when you said like um, we need like information that will help our movements, yeah. If anybody wants to take on a research project that has like academic resources, which I don't, um, there's a correlation apparently between women who have been pushed off of welfare from the welfare reform <gasps> of 1996 wow. yeah, yeah, and the yeah, dramatic the increase of women of going into prison. Yeah. However, there yes. have been no actual that I found. You know, maybe like my my I don't have all the academic resources that people in universities right. do. Right. There don't seem to be any studies that specifically look at. The women Urgent. who have been pushed off of, uh, off of welfare mm. and the rise in women's incarceration. So that's something that like our movement needs because then we can actually say like this is what happens when you cut our safety nets. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes, and this is what we need. Like idea. this is the kind of information that we need that would be helpful in talking about mass incarceration and how that's it. The public policies that we have that seem so distant from prison policy, uh, prison practices and prison policies, mm -hmm. you know, actually do intersect and impact each other. Yes, we had a survey some years ago that showed with every cut in welfare there was an, an increase of women in prostitution. Mm -hmm. With every single cut. Mm -hmm. We need to have that information yeah. updated and brought. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of research we need. Mm -hmm. you, maybe some people in women's studies will help Victoria Law to do mm -hmm. that Dissertation. research. That's what we'd like to see. Absolutely. So um, I work with the Every Mother is a Working Mother Network, and, um, and I really wanted to, to follow up on what Victoria said here, because that's been a big concern of ours. We formed our group in, uh, to oppose the welfare reform that took away women's entitlement to welfare, and, uh, and, 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 and instead it forced women into workfare, and, forced, uh, and it got rid of our uh, right to a, get a college education, and so on and so forth. And it did in increase also the number of children who were removed from their families uh, what they called abuse and neglect, but it was poverty. Mm -hmm. And so we formed also a group called DHS Give Us, uh, Give Us Back Our Children to really fight with women, um, to fight individual cases, but also to fight th for policy changes so that women wouldn't be losing their children in the first place. Um, but um, I wanted to say that we, we're, one positive note is that there is actually a bill in Congress now called the, the RISE Act that was introduced by um, Gwen Moore, who's a former wealthy mother. Oh. Mm -hmm. From Wisconsin, yeah, you know, yeah. and um, she and she's introduced the, the, an, an act that would change the goal of the current welfare reform, which is caseload reduction, where they aim to throw you off uh, at any cost um, to child poverty reduction, and so they would increase benefits. Um, it would um, it would uh, it would end the life the full family sanctions and some of the punitive measures. Um, it also would um, would require states to um, to f find ways to, to resources, provide resources and support to help families stay together when there's a challenge of the child being taken away. Um, it would, it would um, allow, it would end the ban on people with a felony conviction getting welfare. Um, so it would, it, 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 it doesn't do everything. It doesn't value and give a figure to the what we contribute as mothers and caregivers. But it, it certainly opens the, the it opens the way for that to happen more so. And, to, and it starts to, to um, change um, a system that has ended up, as you say, with more women, women in prison mm -hmm. and, and, um, and homeless and, uh, and with no income at all, mm -hmm. zero money. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, we have a petition that we're circulating on this, which mm -hmm. we hope people will join in because they, um, some of the, the kind of advocacy groups that ha who has funded. It? Who has the petition? Oh, I've got one right here. I was going to take off the filled ones and give you the blank ones. 
had, um, yeah, so you're going to pass that around. Because again, to say, to underscore what Selma's been saying about the nonprofits, some of the groups that, um, that should be publicizing this are, I mean, and because they say it's not going to pass. Well, it's not going to pass if nobody knows about it, and we're not, we don't do anything about it. So please sign and let us know if you're interested in being involved in the, our grassroots campaign we're building on this. Right, thank you. So if you want to find out more about women's right. resistance and organizing, if you want to find out what other groups in this area are doing this work, there's a resource section in the back so you can see what groups are working around pregnancy issues, what groups are working around women's medical issues, what groups are working around specifically around incarcerated women's issues and formerly incarcerated women's issues in New York and how you can get involved. Because again, it's not just about us knowing this information, it's taking it to the next step and acting. Right on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you to a wonderful panel. We start tomorrow morning mm -hmm. and we circulate this petition mm -hmm. in every workshop and uh, in every meeting that's taking place during this left form, get the signatures of people who dares to refuse to sign. That's right, that's okay? right. Okay, we have a winner here, and we will get childcare, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And can I say, can I say, um, can we all say that this workshop um, unanimously agrees that the left forum have yes. child care in every succeeding yes. I second the motion. Yes. 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 Can I have a okay. show of hands, please? Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's unanimous. Any it. refusals? Any <laughs> refusals? <laughs> <laughs> unanimous it is. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes.